Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you on this Thanksgiving week. Hope your plans are going well. If you are traveling, I hope that you have safe travels and you, you know, avoid all crazy weather. Um, If you're flying, I hope your flights go well. Yeah, I just hope you have a smooth and happy and safe Thanksgiving week. We have two interviews this Thanksgiving week, which I am excited to share with you. The first is today, of course, and a returning author. Um, Author Tommy Carbone was here with us back in May to talk about his first book, which was a memoir called Growing Up Greenpoint, talking about his childhood in Brooklyn in the 70s and 80s. He's switched his focus a little bit now with his second book. It is a novel. It is a mystery novel. It is called The Lobster Lake Bandits, Mystery at Moosehead. And let me give you the description from the back of the book. Nothing much really happens in the North Woods. That is, until you mix seaplanes, poachers, game wardens, and strangers in a mystery at the lake. Three generations of the Parker family had grown up in the woods near Maine's Lobster Lake. The Parkers knew the roads, trails, and lakes around their cabin better than anyone, except maybe the local game warden. It was always a peaceful and safe place. That all changed the year Joe Parker rescued a girl, the oddly dressed stranger stalked their woods, and the bandits caused some serious trouble. So this book takes place in flashbacks. The more modern uh, period is takes place in the 80s, and then the flashbacks take place in the 50s, and there's a couple of even earlier flashbacks before that. So I know that sounds confusing, but it really isn't when you're reading it, because the flashbacks to the 50s focus on Joe and his father, and they've recently lost Joe's mother, um, not she she died not so very long before the book takes place so there's memories of her as they are experiencing kind of their firsts without her so there's a lot of memories of her so you kind of get a few flashbacks within flashbacks as you get to know Joe's mom so you've got the 80s and the 50s you've got mysteries you have Maine almost as another character because it's this fascinating place that you can just feel yourself in as you're reading. Tommy does a really great job of describing the area. He even includes maps and pictures in the book, so you get some sense of the place. I have never been to Maine. It's one of the places that I've always wanted to go. It reminds me a little bit of Montana, where I grew up, but I know it, it's different in so many ways. But it's definitely on my, my list of places to travel to eventually. And it just, it seems beautiful. There's lots of lakes. There's all of, you know, there's a bunch of hiking and hunting and outdoor activities, but then you get these mysteries. So this is the first of a series. And I was happy about that because with the flashbacks, you don't get as much about Joe and Sarah's story. Joe and Sarah, Joe is uh, the main character throughout the book. Sarah is in some of the flashbacks and then a main character in the parts that take place in the 80s and they seem to be developing a relationship. When I finished the book, I thought, wait a minute, I didn't get a few questions answered and what about Joe and Sarah? We just started scratching the surface of this relationship. What is going to happen? So fortunately for me and my insatiable curiosity, this is the first of three planned books in the Moosehead Mystery Series. So there will be more. We'll get a few of those questions explained. There's some more mysteries. And I'm really looking forward to returning to the the North Woods and spending some time there. 
even if you're not an outdoors person, it's really fun to do it in a book. <laughs> you can travel the outdoors, you can hike, you can experience Maine winter without having to actually wait for the snowplow, all that good stuff. So it, it's a really good way to experience a place you haven't been. And like I said, Tommy does a great job of describing it. In fact, I'm going to let him describe it now in his own words instead of mine. So let's go ahead and turn to the interview with author Tommy Carbone. Again, the book is The Lobster Lake Bandits, Mystery at Moosehead. Hi, Tommy. Welcome to the Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. I'm happy to be here. It's wonderful to have you back, and we are here to talk about your new book, uh, Mystery at Moosehead. But before we do that, for people who might not have heard your first interview or who maybe need a refresher, can you tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Currently, I live in Maine with my family, and writing has been something that started as a side hobby for me. It's something I started during our long Maine cold snowy winters, and it's kind of grown from there. It was just something I started to do to write some stories for some family history, and it just kept going. My childhood was spent in Brooklyn, New York, so I have this experience of city life that I now am contrasting a lot in my writing to living in Maine and the coast and mountains of our beautiful state here. By education, I am an engineer and manager, so I've written a lot of technical articles and technical things, but now I'm enjoying writing books that I would have never imagined I'd be writing fiction and memoir, so it's an interesting gear switch that I'm having a lot of fun with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so now you've, your first book was a memoir, and now you've moved on to a mystery, um, The Lobster Lake Badnets, and it's Mystery at Moosehead. Can you tell us a bit about that story? Absolutely. It was a very fun book. To write, it's a novel set in the north woods of Maine. It's an area where supposedly they've done some counting and they say that moose outnumber people by three to one. And that might be true. There's quite a bit of them up there, particularly in the winter. I think during the summer and the other seasons when we have a lot of tourists, that might not be so, but definitely in the winter. There's a lot of wilderness in that area, and that makes for plenty to do outside all throughout the year. And so Lobster Lake is a setting of the book, and it's a real lake in Maine. It's just north of Moosehead Lake. And it is one that many canoeists actually use to access the same waterway that Henry David Thoreau did on his trip that he wrote about in the Maine woods. So it's got a lot of historical connections there. The story, the novel, takes place in the region around that lake, as well as the town of Greenville, Maine, which is at the, the bottom, most southernmost tip of Moosehead Lake. And there's a little bit of connection to New York City with one of our characters in the book. I think if I had to describe it, I would say the, the story is what might be considered a light historical fiction mystery because it ties together two different unrelated crimes. One is a heist that happened in Boston decades earlier. The other is unfortunately a crime that occurs not only in Maine but in many locations in the wilderness, and I don't want to say too much about that from a spoiler perspective, but it's something that does occur. So there's some things that the characters get wrapped up around those two crimes. And in the book, Stan Parker and his son, Joe, who have a camp on Lobster Lake, they've had it for generations, along with a friend of theirs who happens to be the local game warden, get mixed up in investigating and trying to solve the crimes with another person, a stranger, that appears in their woods. And at first they, they thought he was friendly, but he may have ulterior motives. So there's a little bit of mystery in that as well. I tell the story from a, a flashback perspective. So two of the main characters had met once earlier when they were teenagers, Joe and Sarah. And then many years later, they see each other again in Greenville by chance, and a romance seems to develop between the two of them. So there's a little bit of the crime aspect and the, the game warden aspect of the main woods, but there's also some uh, romance as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's in flashbacks. The, the more modern setting is in the 1980s. Am I remembering that correctly? Correct. And it's, then um, back to the 50s. 
Correct. So okay. there's um, that to kind of sway back and forth where when Joe and Sarah meet again, they start to remember what happened earlier. Right. And so talk a little bit more about Joe and Sarah as the main characters. What, do you, what about them do you think will resonate with readers? Well, Joe is definitely a Mainer through and through, or as people here in Maine say or spell it, Maina with U-H on the end. And he loves his camp in the woods, and he's a definite outdoorsman. And he's a huge Red Sox fan, which everybody in Maine pretty much is. And I think he's a bit of a humble guy, but he's also pretty reserved. And I don't really get into a lot of his backstory in this first book, but we get to see his romantic streak as he shows Sarah around the area, and they start to uh, learn more and more about each other from an adult perspective. He doesn't have a lot of um, affinity for crowds or cities or fancy restaurants. He's just kind of a down-to-earth guy enjoying his life in the north woods of Maine. Sarah, on the other hand, is a writer. She's from New York City. She loves the city, but I think she has got this inner conflict where she's struggling with the confines of being between skyscrapers all the time. She lives in a tiny apartment above a noisy Manhattan street, uh, street, and she thinks she loves it, but maybe not so much but it's the life she always dreamed of having. And then she's forced to go to Maine for a story, and she meets Joe, and she starts to kind of rethink this this woods versus city life, and there might be more to life than cappuccinos and off-Broadway shows. Mm-hmm. So I think that the, both of those main characters resonated a lot with people. One, one woman <laughs> asked me at a, a signing, she actually had read the book already, and she came to buy a signed copy if, Joe was based on a real person and if he was single. So she must have really liked him. Another woman came for a signed book to give to somebody, and she had read the book, and she was from Manhattan originally, and she now lives in Maine. And she told me, wow, it's like you knew me. I could have been Sarah. So I think there's a lot of real-life elements, as usual, with writing Mm -hmm. that's in there that people start to resonate with. Yeah. And you... You mentioned that there are two crimes in this story. Did you start with that as your inspiration, or was Maine your inspiration? Where did this story kind of spring from? <laughs> you know, I wish I would have written that down when I started, how it started, where it started. And I wanted to spotlight the area in Maine of Greenville, of Moosehead Lake. We have a lot of people that visit Maine. They love Maine. I see a lot of online posts with their their pictures and how they love their summer vacation. And obviously there are people that come here for their winter vacations. But there's not a lot written about the interior part of the state. It's a part of the, the area that's near and dear to my heart. We have a camp there. We spend a lot of time there. And so that was more of the inspiration. It was around the location and the setting of the small town, the Mountain Lake town. Then I just started to build from there. And it became Greenville and the seaplane fly-in that we have there every year. And then tying together timelines and events and people, and it just mushroomed. It was no outline. I don't outline when I write anything. And so it just, you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, that's a good idea. Let's put that in the story. And then I move things around. I do a lot with post-it notes when I write, so my stories ebb and flow, and I throw pieces away, and I put new pieces in. and So it all started with just the area of that part of Maine and then took off from there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump in here now because we do have to take our first break of the podcast. But I do want to say that I love listening to the way authors craft their stories, the way they outline or chart their stories. And I just have this visual in my head of... um, kind of like one of those walls that you see in crime dramas where they've got all the all the stuff up on the wall the pictures the clues the the strings the the, the thumb the, the thumbtacks but i have this picture in my head with with post it notes it's probably not what Tommy does it all, but I like to have these strange pictures in my head. And I just love to picture all of these processes that help authors to keep track of their story and where they're going. I find it fascinating. But we do have to take our first break. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Hi, this is Sarah, host of the GSMC Book Review Podcast. 
as not only the host of a book review podcast, but also someone who loves to read, I get excited when I get to recommend books for you, and I have one of those today. The New York Times bestselling author of Hoot, Carl Hyacin, is back with Squirm, a wildly entertaining, slightly twisted new adventure about snakes, grizzly bears, a spy drone, a missing dad, and knowing when and when not to let things go. Squirm is recommended for readers ages 8 through 12, so if you have someone in your life who might enjoy this book or someone in your life who you already know loves Carl Hyacin, maybe you love to read together as a family. Whether you're already fans or you're looking for something new to read, I can definitely recommend Squirm by Carl Hyacin. Support for this message comes from Random House Children's Books, and Squirm is available now wherever books are sold. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Tommy Carbone about his second book, uh, The Lobster Lake Bandits, Mystery at Moosehead. And speaking of that part of Maine and and um, your affinity for it, you also include some maps and some pictures, which you don't often get in, in novels. What, what made you decide to, to include those? Well, I do a lot of reading of these type of stories and also even real life stories of people that travel or do river trips or backwoods uh, hiking and they kind of describe the area but then you're going online to f- try to find it and is it real is it made up and uh, how does that play into the story so i decided to include those because i like when people do include some of that stuff in the book with pictures as well and my sister actually commented, she said, why are there maps in here? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, I can just want to envision it myself in my mind. And then other people were thanking me for including the map to show them where that area of Maine was, because Maine is just so big. And that area alone is bigger than Massachusetts and Rhode Island and you know, New Hampshire. It's just a tremendous section of the country. Well, and there's, there's a lot of... Um you know, moving around in the book as they, you know, as as they're hunting, as they're hiking, as they're doing all kinds of things throughout the story. And there's, I'm going to use hyperbole here, a million lakes. So I, I found the maps helpful to just kind of put everything in perspective as to, okay, they were here, now they're over here. Where, what exactly, you know, how exactly are they moving around this area? Sure. And that's good to hear because it took a lot of time because I had to hand draw those for copyright reasons. You have to do all that yourself. Oh. So putting that together, and I'm not an artist, so even the sketches that are in the book, those are things that I just sketched myself. And all the pictures that are in there of the deer, the mountains, or the lakes, those are photos from the actual area that I've taken over the years. Nice. Okay. Thank you. But it's certainly not just a main story, I think. I think the idea of that concept of getting away will resonate with a lot of people. People that I've talked to, it's strange, you get notes from people that live in Wisconsin, and they have... You know, thousands of lakes there as well, and they say a lot of the same things happen or occur to them, and they love the idea of being able to get away from the city for a little bit and enjoying the outdoors. So it takes people to a setting that either reminds them of some place they've been or some place they want to go. Mm-hmm. And the settings are are fun because it's the 50s and the 80s, so obviously there's a little more technology in the 80s, but it's not like the technology we have now. You know, there's no phone at camp, there's um, there's no TV at camp, there's a radio, but it sometimes is a little sketchy depending on the weather. <laughs> so you really get that sense of leaving a lot behind. Right. And at our camp, we don't have a TV. Um Internet is now available, unfortunately. <laughs> on, the, on the road, there are some people that have that, and they have cable, and it's just like being at home, and we've kind of resisted that from the perspective of just being away. Yeah, yeah. I think you've touched on this a little bit, but um, what are the autobiographical elements that you included in the book, if any? I didn't realize it or set out to do that, but I've heard someplace somewhere that somebody said all writing is autobiographical in some way or, or some some fashion. And there are definitely elements about how I love Maine and Moosehead Lake and that area, 
definitely Joe has some of those aspects in him and how much my family enjoys being in that location. There are certainly some parts of the story that actually happened to me, and for those readers that read the book, well, they'll get to a point where Joe is out canoeing on his own in the lake and something happens to him with a moose, and so I won't get into too much of the story, but <laughs> that <laughs> actual part of that story will actually be in a different memoir that I have coming up about uh, my life around camp. That actually happened to me, not exactly the way it happened to Joe in that book, but there are definitely certain aspects that I pulled in from real life and real events into the book. All I can say is yikes, because I know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I've, I've, I've encountered moose. I, I grew up in Montana, and they are not small. No. Yeah. Um, what kind of research did you do for the book? Quite a bit, actually. Um, I knew I wanted to have something with the, the game wardens in there, and so I did talk to game wardens about things that happen in the woods around Maine and also arrests of those who have been convicted of such crimes that happen in the book. So I read a lot of articles around that. So I had to research things about poaching and wildlife vandalism. I also had to research once the robbery that took place in Boston. It doesn't really have any direct connection to Maine that I'm aware of, but it, it was kind of wrapped into the novel. And since it is a novel and I'm a writer, I get to write whatever I want, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it is put in there, and I had to research about that because there has to be some realistic elements of it because it is a true event. It did happen, but these people are trying to investigate this connection in Maine. So I did read a lot about that robbery and watched a movie about that robbery, so that stuff is incorporated. There are also elements of the time period, like you mentioned, around the radio at camp and no TV at camp, no phone at camp. That had to be realistic of the times. And the stranger that gets wrapped up in the book that um, Joe and Stan and the game warden meet uses a small camera to take some pictures. And I didn't want that to be made up or science fiction, so I did some research around that. And back in the 70s, I had a very small camera that was about the size of a ring box, not much bigger than a roll of film at the time. But I needed to know, was that available in the 1950s? And it turns out it was. So I'm able to reference the exact Kodak camera that people used and put those elements in the book to give it that time perspective. Hmm. And there's also a lot of history around Greenville. So there's a lot of books written about Greenville from a historic perspective. And I visited the Greenville Historic Society and the museums and looked at what they had and the black and white photos from the time and also made reference to a lot of the Rose writings from his visits to Maine. Mm -hmm. And the fly-in is a real event, right? That happens every year? Correct. And I believe we've had 45 of those now. And so it happens every September in Greenville. And it's funny, for the first couple of years, we were going there as vacationers. And we would be at a different part of the lake on the weekend we didn't even know the flying was happening. Oh, wow. And then one weekend, we drove into town, and there's no traffic light in town, so it's a very small mountain town, and there are just thousands and thousands of people there. And we're like, what is happening? So every year since, we try to go and enjoy the flying festivities with the craft shows and the antics of the seaplane pilots and what they do for events and competitions, so that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so this is the Lobster Lake bandits and you keep saying books so can we expect more yes because i can't fit it all in one book uh, <laughs> i would have tried but it would have been too big for people to to digest and to read so this is the first book in what i'm calling the moosehead mystery series and right now i have three books planned the next one will be out sometime next year i'm not going to say exactly when i'm trying to build the audience and see what they think about this first one the early readers have loved the characters and are already pushing me on Facebook for the next book and emailing me when's the next book coming out. Um, so I do have plans for that, and I'm still working through the, the edits on the second book, which is tedious, and the third book, which is fun because I'm in the writing stage, so I get to make everything up, and mm -hmm. that just kind of flows much quicker. So are you envisioning three books? Yes, at least. Okay. And uh, I'm assuming, you should never assume, but will they all feature Joe and Sarah, or will we be getting other characters? I do bring other characters in, but definitely 
the next two also feature Joe and Sarah as central to the stories and what develops between the two of them and the adventures they have in the woods in, in Maine and New York. Uh, so book one gave an introduction to them, and then we'll start to fill in the, their backgrounds a bit more in book two. And then there will be some characters that reappear in each book. And because I'm playing with these historical fiction flashbacks of some real events in each book, that is allowing me to tie in some of those same characters. So the game warden, who is a, a real character in book one, does appear in, in book two as well. Okay. Okay, great. Um- Jumping in for that second break of the podcast. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with author Tommy Carbone. So as we said before, this is your second book. Your first one was a memoir called Growing Up Greenpoint. And when you were on the first time, you talked about, we talked about that. But can you just give us a brief, I don't know, your your, your brief elevator pitch for people who haven't read it? Sure. That book is a, a memoir. So it's a kid's life in 1970s Brooklyn, and it's the times of my childhood and early teen years in New York City. The stories include events and times with my family and friends back during those years. I wrote the stories originally for my family and then to share memories with them, but after reflecting on the stories, I started to think that would be fun to share with others and also as a way to preserve some of the things that happened during those those decades. It was a pretty different time for New York, not just demographically, but technology-wise there are a lot of changes that happen. And one of the readers that read the book probably gave me one of the highest compliments now that I look back on what I wrote there. She called me a true anthropologist, Hmm. and she loved how I captured the language and the mores of my world in that place and time. And that was part of it for keeping some of that alive and sharing it with others, so I'm glad that she recognized that. We were always getting yelled at back then to go out and play, and a lot of times you don't see kids playing outside today on organized sports. It's so organized now. Back then it was just street games, and I talk a lot about those street games and the street food that we ate and the trouble we got into sometimes, and it's, it's fun. I tried to keep it fun, and one nice person recently wrote that the book made her laugh until tears were coming down her face, so I think that makes me happy because that's kind of what I wanted, and there's some other tear aspects of the other kind in there from an emotional perspective that I still get teared up about. So it's, I think it's fun, but emotional and gives people a perspective of what it was like as a kid in New York City during those years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were pretty free range. I mean, <laughs> my mom said, I'd kill you now if I knew you were doing that stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think when most people think about uh, New York City, they probably are thinking about like New York, maybe not Brooklyn, but you know, just thinking about letting your eight year old out <laughs> to, yes. to walk to school or any of those things it would freak a lot of people out in this. You cracked me up on Twitter a while back because you posted that your dentist asked you about your memoir and like, what did he say? Are you famous or something? <laughs> yeah, we got into uh, talking about you know what what's going on in my life, and I said, well, I just released a, a book, a memoir. 
And he looked at me and said, well, are you famous? <laughs> 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 did you have a bad childhood? Right. And I'm like, no, not really, neither. He's like, well, then what did you write about? <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that kind of is a pet peeve of mine. A lot of people think memoir is this, negative, life-changing thing that happened to you or something dark. And there are certainly a lot of memoirs where people share those experiences. But there are also a lot of memoirs. I mean, Bill Bryson talks a lot about his travels, and they're fun memoirs. So I think there's this connotation that all memoirs are this, this dark thing that may have happened to somebody. And right. right. not or, always that case. Or written by celebrities, you know, and, and kind mm. of humorous anecdotes from their life. Yeah. So how was the writing experience different? Because you started with a memoir and then you moved on to a novel. Um, so you went from nonfiction to fiction. You went from, um, well, also first book to second book. How was the writing experience different when you wrote your second book? Going to the writing fiction was a lot of fun because I got to make everything up. Whereas the memoir, I had to keep it true, but I also had to make it fun. So putting the fun aspects into the reader's perspective so that they could see what happened. Writing the novel, all those pieces had to fit together. So I would think I had all the holes in the plot filled, but as I read it back, I'm like, oh boy, I can't do that. <laughs> That's not how this can happen. Writing the memoir, it's while it's not chronological per se, year for year of my childhood, the stories are jumbled up and mixed up. They're all true things that happened. Where in the novel, I didn't know it was going to happen. And sometimes when you're four or five chapters ahead, you forget about what did happen. So there's a lot of storylining that has to happen. But it definitely was an interesting experience to write the novel and be able to spotlight the real part of me and that I wanted to, to spotlight. Um, and I don't outline anything I write, and I think that's because in college and all the classes I ever took, took we were forced to outline, so <laughs> I completely resist that now. And so it's very difficult during the editing stage to make sure I go back and do chapter maps. So it's almost a reverse outlining. After things are written, I then make maps of what I wrote and how things came together. What is next writing-wise? You've mentioned a memoir, another memoir. You've mentioned the, two, the next two books in this series. What are you working on right now? Three or four things in the pipeline, and I do that purposely because it's easier to write a first, second draft of a book because it's freewheeling for me versus editing is a little bit more tedious. So the next book in the Moosehead Mystery Series is being edited. So it's on probably draft number 15. <laughs> I can't disclose the title yet because it's central to the mystery, the historical fiction piece of that book. But at the same time, I'm writing pieces of the third book. And I think that's important because there has to be some character continuity and story continuity, so I can't release book two until I've got some of book three put together. And But it's also easier for that writing for me to be able to just write, and I just sit down in a quiet space with a block of time to do, do the writing. Whereas doing the editing, I need more short spurts cause, because I just don't have the attention span to do the detail editing line by line, paragraph by paragraph. The other big thing I'm working on is my memoir that's going to be called There's No Place Like Camp, which is a connection of world travel stories and camp life. So as part of my prior roles in doing some engineering work, I was traveling the world for more than a decade, so I've got a lot of cultural stories that I'm trying to tie back to how that's different when you're at some place like camp in, in Moosehead Lake. So putting those experiences together and weaving those stories with some educational aspects of how different people live with fun aspects of how people live is uh, kind of an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm actually backtracking a little bit because I was just looking at the book again. And um, at the beginning, you have praise for the book from John Ford Sr., who is author and retired Maine game warden and county sheriff. Uh, so, and he has some books that sound, well, kind of hilarious. Is this someone that you know? Did, did you talk to him about being a game warden? I did uh, speak with him, and uh, he provided some very early feedback on the book. And it's interesting, the game warden in the book is called Henry Ford. He's named Henry Ford. And that's because one of the antagonists drives a red Ford, uh, Ford truck. 
So it wasn't really based upon John, <laughs> but John happens to be John Ford, and he also is a game warden, so he did provide some great insight into uh, the early draft of the book, and I also admire a lot of his writings, because he writes all true stories about his time as a game warden, catching poachers and people in the backwoods of Maine, so there are there are a lot of fun stories in that. And he's also... Um, pokes fun at himself quite a bit, and so I like that, uh, and so I try to do that as well. Nice. Okay, thank you. Is the is this book out now or soon? It is out, so the Lobster Lake Bandits is out. It was published late September. It is available you know, up on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, and it's available in expanded distribution, so small independent bookstores can also order that, and it's on iBooks and Kindle Every place a book can be, probably. Mm-hmm. And do you do you still get the pictures and the maps when it's on in an ebook form? Yes, yes. It's also available in large print. So I did get some feedback because I published Growing Up Greenpoint in large print, and actually it's been very well received. There are a lot of people that like that format. So Lobster Lake is also available. Mm-hmm. Have you ever thought about audio books, for, especially for the memoir? I have. I just need to think about who would do the recording of that. And since the memoir is kind of an Italian-American-based thing, I don't think Robert De Niro is available to do <laughs> the audio. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have thought about it. I just don't know. You know, it's very, I think, um, expensive to get somebody to do that audio recording, so I need to figure out how to do that. Right. Okay. Um, so where can people find you online? Website, social media, etc. All of the social media Links are available at www.tommycarbone.com. From there, you can link to Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Goodreads, YouTube, all those typical places that people go to find out information. And I post pretty frequently on those different platforms. And YouTube, I'm starting to compile some playlists because people are interested in both Brooklyn, New York, Greenpoint, New York, as well as Moosehead Lake. So I've been putting together playlists for people to go and experience the area. From those places, I love hearing from people, either direct messaging or if they post something back to a post I have up on Facebook, that is great. I also share images of Moosehead Lake and the region, as well as events that are going on up there. Yeah. Um, So is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to mention about writing or books or Maine or anything that we haven't covered? I think oh, what I didn't mention was I think now my books are starting to show up in libraries. It's taken a long time to get into that pipeline. It's fairly slow, but that also includes ebooks where libraries offer that service. So if there are people that would like to check out books or request ebooks from libraries, they can certainly do that from their local library and they should be able to get those titles. The best way for readers to follow up in what's going on with updates is probably my Amazon author page. So people can go on Amazon and follow me up there, and that's a great place to get connected and hear updates. And lastly, I do have signed books available for sale on eBay, so people can go up there if they want to buy something for somebody for Christmas. I can do a custom uh, name or signing in that, and those can go out in time for Christmas if they get them ordered here in the next couple of weeks. We're getting close to the end of the supply on that and also the timeline to get those mailed out for Christmas, but those are available. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you again for taking time out of your weekend to uh, come back back on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm, I'm living vicariously through your snow. <laughs> you said you had, to, you had to go out and take care of snow this morning. Yes, we did. It's just kind of like in Lops Lake Band. It's the surprise early snowfall. Well, again, thank you so much for coming back to the podcast to talk about your book. Thank you so much, for Sarah, for having me, and I look forward to hearing from people. I want to once again thank my guest, Tommy Carbone, for taking the time to come back to the podcast to talk about his book. Again, the book is The Lobster Lake Bandits, Mystery at Moosehead. It is the first of three. It is available now. So if this is something you're interested in, and if you want to give someone a signed copy, there's still some time to do that uh, in time for the holidays. Although, as Tommy said, those supplies are running low, so you want to do that sooner rather than later. If you want to take your chances, 
chances on a not personalized signed copy, but a signed copy, I do have some to give away. Hooray. So in order to enter to win a copy of the Lobster Lake Bandits Mystery at Moosehead by Tommy Carbone, it's very easy. All you have to do is go to our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and comment on the post with this episode. It's episode 123, Interview with Tommy Carbone. That's it. Go to those websites, follow us, please, and comment on this post, episode 123, Interview with Tommy Carbone, and you'll be automatically entered to win a copy, a signed copy of the Lobster Lake Bandits Mystery at Moosehead. It's great if you or someone that you love like books that are that have mystery, that have a little bit of romance, a little bit of historical fiction, and or if you're just fascinated with or interested in Maine, then this is a good way to read, you know, but you don't want to read like a travel guide or something, you can read historical fiction and find out more about the North Woods of Maine. So thank you once again to Tommy for joining me for the interview. Thank you to you, my listeners, for joining me and always being so wonderful. I really appreciate you. I love hearing from you. So let me know your thoughts. Let me know what you're reading. And I hope you all have a wonderful and safe Thanksgiving. Rather than the usual Thursday episode, uh, this next episode will be airing on Friday this week. So we can all enjoy our turkey coma. Uh, that interview on Friday will be with author Susan K. Hamilton about her dark fantasy novel Shadow King. So very different from today's episode, but a lot of fun. And um, yeah, join me on Friday for that interview. In the meantime, have a wonderful, safe Thanksgiving. And if you have time off, or even if you don't have time out off, find some time to go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.